guys, it's Melissa Moore. Thanks for joining me for episode seven of Faith, Hope, Love, where we grow together in our faith, increase in hope, and learn how to better love God and love other people. So this episode, I'm so excited to have a wonderful guest, Adrienne Hellman from Salt and Light Works in Tulare County, and they serve the homeless community of Tulare County. We'll have her on the show in just a few minutes, but I wanna talk first about the value and the importance of salt and light. So I think about for me personally, I was eating a baked sweet potato this week. They're very versatile, you can bake them, you can fry them, but when I first made it, I didn't put any salt on it. And it, it just, I mean, sweet potatoes are great, but it just wasn't perfect. But I put a little bit of salt, I put a little pepper, and it just brought that sweet potato to life. And it just, it makes me want to eat more of them. And I will not eat another sweet potato without some salt on it. And I think about light. Right now, you guys, I am recording at night because hashtag mom life. And if I didn't have lights, guys, you wouldn't be able to see me. I'd be literally recording in the pitch black. And the importance of sunlight, right? It's good for our health. We need to be getting outside in some sun. And the importance of having natural light in our homes is so powerful. If it's sunny outside, we gotta open our windows, open up the curtains and just let the natural light come in. And it just doesn't make sense to, again, put food <laughs> in our bodies that doesn't have a little bit of salt on it. It just doesn't taste right. And it doesn't make sense to live our lives in darkness. And so we hear from Jesus in episode, what would essentially be part two of his Sermon on the Mount series, if you will, we hear him talk about the value of Christians living as salt and light. We need to live in the world in a way that we're gonna bring flavor, we're gonna bring joy, we're gonna bring goodness, and we wanna live a life of value. And we wanna shine light to the world that is, is really dark and is really hurting. And that light is Jesus. He is the light of the world. And we need to be reflecting his light, shining his light to give encouragement to others. And so we're gonna jump on in and learn from what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter five. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Imagine if you're cooking and all of a sudden you go to put salt in and it just doesn't taste like anything. You would immediately throw out that salt because it's worthless. You can't use it for anything. Maybe the, the most you could use it for is throwing it on ice, maybe to help melt the ice, but that's all that it would be good for. Or maybe to keep the dirt down in that culture. And it's, it's worth nothing if it's not salty. And Jesus goes on, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And so Jesus is, is telling his disciples, telling his followers, listen, you need to stand out. You've got to give some value to the world. You need to be salty, not in the traditional modern sense of being salty. You need to bring life to other people. You need to bring value and worth in, in giving this hope of Jesus away. As Christians, we are supposed to bring life, bring joy, bring vibrancy. Are we doing that? And then Jesus talks about being this light. And it's like this idea of you, you light a light, you're not going to cover it up. Right? What would be the point of that? It would be like taking your Christmas tree that you've taken all this time to decorate and then just putting a big cloth over it to cover up all the light. There's no way to enjoy the beauty of your Christmas tree if you cover it up. In the same way, we need to be sharing the joy and the love of Jesus in a way that brings glory to God. We shouldn't cover up our faith. We need to be bold be salt and be light. And the reason we're doing that is not to point to ourselves as being good and worthy to receive affirmation or accolades from other people. The reason that we do good work is to point to Jesus. 
Now, how do we apply that today, right? That's a very quick study, but it's really simple. If we claim to follow Jesus, our lives have to show it. And again, not in a way that brings attention to us, glory to us, but gives glory to God, points people to God. We have a very special guest on today's episode who is the CEO of Salt and Light based out of Tulare, California. And she's a really phenomenal human being, loves the Lord. And I just, I'm so excited for her to be able to share a little bit about what she's about and uh, what's happening at Salt and Light. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Adrienne Hillman and yep, I'm the CEO and founder of Salt and Light Works. And so what Salt and Light is, is um, basically our mission is to the chronically homeless. You know, those are the folks we love and we um, are cultivating community for them in a couple different ways. So we, we believe really strongly that housing doesn't solve homelessness, but that community does. And so what that means is that, yes, we absolutely think people need dignified homes and um, a place to call home, but also they need dignified work, you know, um, through micro enterprise. That's kind of how we do it. And our, we're really basing off an off uh, model in Austin, Texas called Community First Village, and they have micro enterprises. And so what that means is just like on site in our small village or in um, any kind of housing community that we go into and cultivate community, we create small enterprises that aren't quite like a full blown operation. It's something more like an art house where folks are able to create um, things to sell at a marketplace so that they can create dignified income for themselves. Or um, for instance, in Austin, they have an amphitheater there on site. And so one of the micro enterprises would be, you know, the folks are able to be concessionaires, they sell um, uh, tickets, and then they have the maintenance crew. And um, so those folks are able to create dignified income themselves through that small micro enterprise. So it's not like we're not sending them down to the local movie theater to do work. That would be considered large enterprise. Instead, micro enterprise on site in community. That's kind of how that works. So our mission is to be cultivating community in spaces. And then also we're cultivating our own community. So we're creating a master plan, intentional community to lift the chronically homeless off the streets of Tulare County and into what is like a miniature city, a mini community um, replete with jobs, homes, uh, medical care, health care. So pretty much whole person care, wraparound services for folks who have been living on the streets prior. Um, and so, and just to, to clarify, chronically homeless means to have been on the streets for a year or more or an aggregate of a year or more over a three year period. Uh, what really inspired you to get this on the ground? Well, um, truly I, um, I got a call, what I felt like was a call right in the middle of church one day. And it was seemed really clear to me. I had never gotten what I felt like was a word from God. I didn't, I mean, I, I'm sure I probably had, but I didn't, I didn't sound quite so clear, but it sounded something like you're going to serve the homeless. And it was like, no, actually I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I had no experience whatsoever in the homeless realm. And all I knew was that it, there was some tug and I, it, it like, it almost felt like it came to me in a dream, except I was conscious. But, um, I really do feel like it was God speaking to me. And honestly, I was really like, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not equipped. I can't. Um, and it wasn't long after that I was actually asked to be um, on a, on the board of a nonprofit, a homeless nonprofit. And I thought, well, there it is. There's my sign. I just, am going to be on a board. Right. And no, right out of the gate, I realized that I was super frustrated with what I saw in terms of both how people experiencing homelessness were being treated and talked about mm -hmm. in groups like the board and with administrative, um, you know, teams, um, and also just the ge general cultural view of homelessness was really stunning to me, that lack of compassion, it really spurred me into action. And so it wasn't that long before, um, I actually was listening to Jen Hatmaker's podcast and our friend Jen, who we love so much, she, um, was, it, she was interviewing a man named Alan Graham, who she said to the audience, listen, if you're doing any work in the homeless realm, you need to know Alan Graham. And he, has, he was promoting his book called Welcome Homeless, and it was a chronicle of kind of how he got the call, kind of like I did, in a way that he was not prepared, was not, was not what he was thinking he was going to be doing with his life. He was a developer in Austin, and he got what he felt like was a call. And so they started a food truck ministry, and then through that food truck ministry, they realized that what people really need is community. And so um, the one thing we believe, and Alan has taught me this, is that the greatest cause of homelessness is actually a profound catastrophic loss of family 
rather than what we think of it is as mental illness or addiction. While those are definitely mitigating factors, um, when you drill it down just a little beneath that, we believe it's like the um, catastrophic loss of family. And so Alan created his own master planned intentional community in Austin, Texas, the first of its kind in the United States. And so we're actually using that model. I actually started learning at the feet of Alan Graham several years ago. And um, I've been to Austin many times. I'm very familiar with the project and I followed their blueprint. And so if we get this off the ground in California, we'll be the first um, of its kind after Austin in the United States. So, is there a projected timeline of what that looks like? Yeah, well, the timeline shifts a lot. As you can imagine, it's really difficult to find land and it's difficult to raise funds. I, mean, I started this from scratch, from the ground up. It's a total, non, uh, total startup and that's hard <laughs> in the nonprofit realm. That's really hard to do. And I didn't even know what I was biting off when I did. <laughs> Well, but, um, but uh, we actually think we're going to be able to get a pilot village off of the ground with 60 homes. So we actually had a larger scale vision of like more like 200 homes, but I think our first phase is going to look something more like 60 homes and uh, fingers crossed we're waiting on some funding and we'll know more about that kind of uh, after the first of the year. And once we, once we know, we think we can probably at least get going next year in midsummer and then hopefully be finished by either the end of the year or by um, shortly after in 2022. Yeah. Very good. And so, um, you know, with that, you know, what community are you reaching? Is it mostly men, mostly women and children? So chronically homeless by nature, just for folks who have lived on the streets for a year or more, aggregate of a year or more, they're typically un unaccompanied males or females. And that demographic mix is, um, yeah, typically more males, but they're definitely females. Um, and so we won't, people always ask us, are you going to be serving families? And we always say, we will not serve families. However, families, um, and like, so there is kind of a ranking order in terms of um, what services are brought to people in, in what order. And so families are obviously top priority. Children are top priority. Veterans and, you know, women who are at risk those are top priority. And so the folks we serve are really the most outcast, despised, you know, and lost and lonely among us. And those are the folks that have kind of fallen through every rung. In Larry County, most of our um, population of people experiencing homelessness are chronically homeless because there's no shelter here. There's very little shelter, very little housing here. And so by design, um, our project, our project will serve almost every it could have served every almost every homeless person in Tulare County by just by design because of our demographic here, and that I find that sad because we know that folks who are chronically homeless are actually far more traumatized. The longer folks spend on the streets, the more traumatized they become. The harder it is to help them settle and heal. And um, you know, for us, um, one thing that people ask about our village is that like when do you get people up and out? It's like, oh no, that's not the point. Like we actually don't want people to leave. We actually will have a columbarium and a memorial garden where people can, can die with dignity as well. Um, one of the loneliest things that people uh, on the streets kind of experience is the belief that they will die alone. And in many cases they do. And unmarked deaths, not, a life not celebrated. And we don't want that. Um, but we also don't need people to transition up and out of community. That's not what community really is, right? It's not a program. It's a community. And um, that's a different model than most that you see of folks serving homeless um, neighbors, you know, usually there's kind of an end game, like how can we measure this, right? How can we get people up and out? How many people are getting up and out? And, and what I think the miss is, is that folks who've experienced chronic homelessness have experienced so much trauma. The chances of them sustaining a good job um, long-term and getting up and out, and they may not even want to be up and out of that community. And so we're not gonna push that. That's just not really the point. The point is um, to provide dig restored dignity through purposeful work, through fellowship and relationship with human to human, heart to heart contact. I love like what you've shared about the idea of creating like a family environment for many that have for an indefinite amount of time have not had a family and, you know, providing family and medical care. And I mean, what are some of the other things that you guys will be providing when you're up and running? Yeah. So it's like a little C. So we'll have things like we'll have a library, you know, we'll, we'll, so folks can check out books and they can check out DVDs. Um, there'll be a farm and a garden. 
Um, so folks will be able to get outside and really work in on with the earth. And I think that's really healing in and of itself. Um, we'll have obviously chapel services available for folks. Um, it's not a requirement and that's um, different than some other programs in the way that, you know, we don't put that first. We feel like we want to bring people to that in a way that feels comfortable for them. You know, a lot of people have been traumatized by church mm -hmm. and we don't want to be re-traumatizing people. And we really don't want to create performative Christianity either, where we're saying, well, you know, when people, people suffer, are suffering, they'll do what they need to do to get what they need. Right. And we don't want people feeling like they need to perform to get the love and care and food and housing that they need by, you know, having some sort of act that says, I, you know, accept Christ or I, um, I'll go to Bible study. I'll, we don't want it to be performative. We want it to feel really natural and relational. And we really, I always say this. Um, so one of the ways we serve, and this is, you know, win, lose, or draw, whether people like agree with it or not, we just feel really comfortable with washing people's feet. And that's what this is. You know, it's not, um, it's not leading with the Bible so much as, as it's leading with the act of acting like Jesus Christ, you know? So um, that to be said, we'll, we'll offer chapel services. We'll also have NA and AA meetings on site, so Narcotics and Nar Alcoholics Anonymous meetings on site. We'll offer exercise classes and yoga. Um, eventually, we will have the NA Amphitheater and the community movie nights. So just a lot of community. People will be out of their homes and, you know, living in relationship with one another. Um, also, one special um, thing about our village is that we will have missional residents. And so missional residents are folks who choose, folks like you and me, who choose to live in mission um, and in relationship with folks who have experienced homelessness. So they choose to downsize their home and, um, and, and it's really a call. So it's something, it, they're folks that we will discern, you know, there's a discernment process that we will go through with those folks. And um, they are special people that really can be the glue that relational glue in our village once, you know, staff goes home. We will be highly staffed, but once that staff goes home, those missional residents really take, take up, um, you know, take up the leadership role in relationship. So it's great. I love that. I mean, it sounds like, you know, the plan that you guys have in place, obviously it's been done really, really well out in Austin. And like you guys have, you know, a huge team. I've been seeing lots of posts and stuff about board members. And it sounds like you've got a phenomenal team that's putting this all together. Um, obviously, you know, I will be, and I'm encouraging people that are listening to this to be praying for this, you know, be, in as many ways as possible, supporting this through funds or um, whatever that looks like. But the thing that I'm really appreciating hearing from you is you guys, you're um, really being salty and being light for people that it's not like you're forcing them to choose Jesus because Jesus didn't do that. Like he didn't force people to follow him, but he was like, look, this is the way I live. It's like this full of love and obviously full of salt and light. And I think I love that about you and like about this ministry is it's just like, hey, let's just help you to feel love and they will see Christ in that. Yeah. I mean, I'm never afraid to speak about my faith. I'm not. I, I never will be with, with the folks in the village. I won't. And anybody that I serve. Um, but I, I just, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like they'll know, they will know that we are Jesus people by our love. Right. And that's important to me. That is of the utmost importance to me. Restoring dignity is also very important to me. And there are ways to do that and ways not to do that. So, you know, those are things that we've built into our culture at Salt and Light that I think have really made us a unique organization in this front. Um, I didn't say this. One of the, um, and, and this is what's happening in real time. So we are actually getting ready to start both a food truck ministry. So and it's not a food truck like people think, like a taco truck that drives up and you can eat at the window. It's more like a canteen truck that's filled with supplies, food supplies that we run out to the streets and to folks who are extricated to the margins and they don't have um, access to services near to town. So for instance, in Visalia, it would be people that are like out at Plaza Park or um, maybe further out to St. John's or down by Target because most of those services or meal services would be at Bethlehem Center of Visalia Rescue Mission. Those are in the center of town. Well, there's a lot of people in a lot of other areas. So that's what our truck would service. But more importantly, we're also getting ready to work inside the 99 Palms Hotel. So the 99 Palms is a housing project that's sponsored by the Housing Authority as well as the Tillery County Health and Human Services Agency. And um, they refurb, it's called Project Room Key, and they refurbished this hotel. Um, and they've got folks living out there. And so it actually we love that they have housing, 
but it proves the concept we believe so firmly, which is that housing doesn't solve homelessness, but community does. And so when we've gone out there, they've got housing and that's really it. So we are actually going to go into that space as a body and create community. So both by beautifying the property, but also by pro uh, providing meals and also some worship and fun and music on Sunday nights. So that's something we're gearing up to do. Um, and that's going to take a lot of help. We're going to need people. So that's something that's happening right now while the village is being planned. So we kind of have, we have things moving on several fronts, but I love that that's happening now so that people can get involved right away. Very cool. Yeah, I love that. Like, I mean, obviously the plan of creating a physical location where you guys are going to be based in the future, that takes so much time and effort planning and obviously getting a state <laughs> a approval and all of that, all the things that go into that. But it's neat that you guys are doing stuff right now to impact the community as is. So um, I guess like what I want to ask is how can people get involved right now? They can uh, volunteer with us by going to our website hitting the volunteer link and um, so they'll fill out a, a questionnaire and we can track with them and decide kind of where to plug them based on what the, how they want to help. Um, we always need donors, always. I mean, we, we really are needing funding, especially here at the end of the year. So we're hoping people will choose us as their end of the year gift because a lot of folks do that for tax purposes. And so that would be very helpful. It's also helpful um, for us to be invited into grant opportunities. So some larger grant opportunities um, for, let's say, for instance, someone like, I'll just make something up, like UPS, a large company like that. Sometimes you can get small local grants, and those are great, but if for a larger grant, a lot of times it takes having known someone in management, and they invite us into those grants, and then we can apply for them. So it doesn't guarantee anything, but that connection is really, really helpful. And then speaking of connections, just connecting us. You know, yesterday someone connected us with a carpenter, and we were really in need of one, and he's going to do some really amazing work for us. So, um, you know, you may know somebody who can help us. I really feel like there's a place for everyone with this project. There's just so much to be done, and everyone has a spot. Um, I had a woman recently who's like, I don't know how I can help. I just want to. Well, she's a horse person. And she's like, I don't know, is there anything I can do with my horses? I'm like, well, I believe equine therapy is really helpful. Would that be something you'd be interested in? She's like, absolutely. So, I mean, we can plug that in with our mental health services. It's just, so the sky's really the limit with, with help, but we need it. We need help. We need monthly donors. We need end of the year donors. Um, hate to be so beggy about money, but dang it, that's just kind of how it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then hands. So we will need folks that want to, to join in and create community at the 99 Palms and create community um, through the food truck. So yeah, food procurement is going to be a biggie for us. So food donations, ongoing food donations are going to be helpful as well. Yeah. I love it. I think that it's great that there's so many ways that people can be getting involved. Um, for those that are wanting more information, what is what are some um, ways we can follow you, what you guys are doing? So um, you can go to our website, saltandlightworks.org, or um, you can follow us on uh, socials, obviously, um, at saltandlight.works, both on Instagram and Facebook. We're also on Twitter. We just don't do a lot on Twitter, so it's probably not the best place for information from us, but we're going to try to ramp that up a little bit more just because we know a lot of people like to follow that particular social media. Yeah, that's how you can find us. And um, my email, you're welcome to email me if someone has a specific um, connection that they'd like, you know, to make with me and someone, um, and they can email me at um, adrienne at saltandlightworks.org. Cool. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being willing just to share um, everything that you guys are doing for the community here. Honestly, like, I'm so thankful that God put that on your heart and that you've taken the initiative to just go and do it. So um, thank you for just being on the show and just for showing us an example of what it looks like to live as salt and light, um, literally <laughs> in, in your example. So um, I'm just so thankful that you're on the show. Well, I'm so grateful that you asked me. Thank you. I'm, thanks for doing such a great show and um, just for highlighting us. I mean, I think what one thing that's you're doing what I need folks to help us do, and that is, um, really you know get the word out about what we're doing and how they can help and this is a great way to do that so thank you i appreciate it well thanks guys for joining me for today's episode i hope that you are encouraged with some practical ways to live as salt and light in the world please take time to support this ministry salt and light to larry they are reaching so many people to encourage them with the gospel and to provide a community 
will give them hope not just for today, but also for eternity. So I'm thankful that you've joined me for this episode. We're gonna be taking a couple weeks break to just enjoy Christmas. And so we will be coming back here in January for our next episode with yet another guest, Rosie McKinney from Fight for Love. So I'm really excited. I hope that you are encouraged by today's episode and I'll see you in just a couple weeks. Have a great Christmas.